Good evening. Welcome to Conversations with Queen's District Attorney Candidates, hosted by the Players Coalition. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Christy Rome. I'm co-managing director of the Players Coalition. The Players Coalition is an independent 501c3 and 501c4 organization that works with professional athletes, coaches, and team owners dedicated to improving social justice and racial equality in our community. We're focused on three key pillars, police and community relations, criminal justice reform, and education and economic advancement. We are hosting district attorney and prosecutor forums across the country, including here in New York, various cities in Virginia, Pennsylvania, and California. Hosting today is Devin McCourty, governing board member of the Players Coalition and free safety for the New England Patriots who helped lead the Patriots win the Super Bowl this year. Welcome, Devin. Thank you. Um, you're probably all wondering why am I here? Um, and the truth is here uh, at the Players Coalition, uh, we've noticed uh, more and more that people are just fed up, you know, with the criminal justice system. And, you know, we decided we wanted to do something. And for far too long, the tough on crime policies that were made to protect our citizens have led to mass incarceration, mass supervision, and more than anything else, it's harming the people uh, that need our protection the most. Uh, mostly people of color and low-income housing. Uh, we at the Players Coalition believe that the community as a whole is better served and protected through a new approach to criminal justice. We are committed to working towards that every day. One of the main areas that we focus on is the prosecutors and the prosecutor's accountability. The prosecutor, more than perhaps any government official, has enough authority to kind of shape the criminal justice system. Uh, by using the discretion, they can decide who gets charged, what they get charged with, and in some cases, they're even involved in the sentencing. Through discussions like these, we can talk about the important issues to Queens. Um, I obviously, I don't live in Queens, but I'm here today to use my platform so that you, the people of Queens, can see um, and voice what's important to you. And um, at the Players Coalition, we've tried to use our platform um, not for ourselves, but a spotlight on people that just don't have a voice for themselves. So I'm very honored uh, to be here today. Um, just a little description about the process. Uh, we will present questions to the panelists for discussion, and at the end, we will have uh, open end for questions from the audience. Um, each candidate will have 60 seconds for your opening statements and 60 seconds for your closing statement. Each candidate will have up to two minutes to give what we expect to be an in-depth, detailed answer. So let's get to it. Let's meet our candidates here. Uh, to start off, um, we appreciate you guys taking the time to come here today. I'm sure you realize the importance. Um, the candidates are Rory Lanceman, New York City Council Member, Melinda, uh, Melinda, Ka Melinda Katz, Queensboro President, <laughs> Jose Nevis, former New York State Attorney General, Deputy Chief, and County Prosecutor. <laughs> Mina Malik, former director of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, prosecutor and DC Deputy Attorney General. <laughs> Tiffany Cabin, a career public defender. <laughs> and Betty Lugo, former prosecutor and defense attorney. Um, lastly, I uh, just want to let everyone know, Greg Lessig couldn't make it um, due to a last minute uh, scheduling conflict, um, but he was supposed to come, but he just couldn't make it. So again, we appreciate you guys taking your time to come here today. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you guys know you guys have done a lot of these uh, candidate forms. So today we're, we're looking to go in depth. We're looking to try to get the specifics of the questions and maybe what your policies might look like in the future. Um, so hopefully we can get really into that and uh, get to the meat of it. Um, so let's get started. We're going to start with our opening statements. Um, do you guys mind starting in alphabetical order? Does that work? Sure. Let's go. Let's do it that way. <clears throat> right here in the front gate. Thank you, everyone. I'm Tiffany Caban. 
Uh, I was born in Richmond Hill, Queens. My parents grew up in the Woodside Projects. And who I am and what I fight for has been shaped by my experiences in over-policed, over-criminalized, resource-starved communities. As a public defender, I've represented over a 1,000 clients. And those experiences have shown me that our broken system is the single most powerful driver of the oppression of our black and brown, low-income, um, immigrant and LGBTQIA plus communities. Our DA's office measures success through numbers of convictions, lengths of sentences, and that culture of convictions at all costs does not keep us safe. We should be asking two questions. How do we make sure our, our, the harm doesn't happen again? How do we keep our community safe? And what do we need? Our public defender's metrics of success, decarcerate, reduce recidivism, apply the law fairly across racial and class lines because stability equals public safety. Uh, it is about time that we have gone from a system of mass incarceration to one that invests in our communities, stabilizes communities, and stops criminalizing poverty, mental health, and substance use disorder. It's the work the public defenders have always done. Thank you. Are we standing or sitting, or does uh, it matter? It, it's totally up to you. Okay, well, I guess I'll stand for the opening at least. Uh, good afternoon, good, uh, good evening. My name is Melinda Katz, and many of you know me here, but I want to tell you what uh, happened to end up standing right in front of you right here today. As a young girl, I faced a huge injustice as a child, and I went to law school in order to make sure that I had the effective tools to be an advocate for those people who felt like they didn't have a voice. I then went to the New York State Assembly, and to get to the assembly, I took on the old boys club, and they said I couldn't win and I shouldn't run, but I did. And then I got to the New York State Assembly, took on HMOs, took on insurance companies to make sure that women got direct access to gynecological services because the HMOs were denying those services to those women. We extended the statute of limitations so that child sexual abusers could be held accountable once that child became an adult. I then went to the New York City Council, and in the New York City Council, I stood up to developers day after day and changed the culture of the council to make sure that we had safe work sites and fair wages for the development. And as the borough president, I have stood up to Donald Trump every single day and his policies against the immigrants of this great borough of Queens with our so many languages in so many countries. We have an immigration task force that, provide, oh, we, that provides legal expertise, and wrap. I'm going to close because it says stop. Thank you for being here tonight. We know you can be anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you. That minute flies, huh? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Councilman Rory Lanceman, and I'm running for district attorney because the criminal justice system here in Queens is racist. It discriminates against poor people. And it does not protect working people, women, immigrants, homeowners, and tenants. That's why in the city council, where I chair the committee that oversees the district attorneys, through the laws that I've passed, the, bill, the uh, funding that I've appropriated, the hearings that I've held, we have directly attacked the over-policing over and mass incarceration of communities of color, the evils of cash bail, the targeting of immigrants for deportation, the scourge of wrongful convictions, the um, uh, attacks on women, and police misconduct. And all of this is deeply personal to me in ways that I'll hopefully have a chance to talk with you about tonight. I've lived the life. I've walked the walk. There's no criminal justice issue that we're going to talk about tonight that I don't have a deep and long public record on. And if you give me the opportunity, I will radically transform the criminal justice system here in Queens. Thank you. I couldn't go home if I didn't. My, my son just told me to say the Patriots suck. I'm sorry. It's just that it, it had to. I'm sorry. We'll, I'm we'll, sorry. We'll handle that later. We'll talk about that later. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mina Malik, and I'm running for district attorney because of three things. Number one, my lived experience of growing up in Queens as an immigrant, a woman of color, a mother to two black sons who has had to have conversations with them about police encounters both on the street and when driving the family car and because I've invo been involved in the criminal justice space for over 20 years. I've been on the defense side as well as the prosecution side. I've worked for the DC Public Defender Service, the Queens District Attorney's Office, specializing in special victims, 
cases, as well as the Brooklyn DA's office where we established a conviction review unit and we exonerated and freed 25 wrongfully convicted people to date. I've also implemented criminal justice reform, and that is what everyone is going to be talking about here tonight, implementing criminal justice reform, but nobody has actually done it without compromising the safety of the community. And that's what I'm here to do, to make sure that we implement criminal justice reform the right way without compromising your safety. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jose Nieves. I've been a progressive prosecutor for 18 years. I've worked with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, the New York State Attorney General's Office, the U.S. Attorney General's Office for the Northern District of New York, and the United States Army as a military, pro as a military prosecutor. I'm a proud Army combat veteran who served our country for 10 years and one year in Afghanistan. I'm a community leader. I've been a community leader for 25 years. I've been living in Southeast Queens for 20 years with my beautiful wife, Vivian, who's here with me today, and my two kids. But I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn, one of the toughest neighborhoods in the city. And I can tell you right now, growing up in that neighborhood in the 1980s and 90s, at the height of the crack epidemic, I saw a lot of crime in the streets. So I know why public safety is so important. But on the other hand, as a man of color, as a Latino, I've been subject to racial profiling because the police have stopped me only because of the way I look. So I know firsthand what the problems are criminal justice systems are. That's why I spent the last few years of my career investigating and prosecuting police officers for causing the death of unarmed civilians. And I, I prosecuted the first homicide against a police officer who it. killed a man, who killed a man in front of his family, and that's why I'm running, to bring justice to those who don't have an opportunity to have justice otherwise. And uh, everybody in the audience, you can, as you see at the top of the screen, uh, hashtag Players Coalition, um, questions, anything, let the people know you're here today. Uh, so we'll jump right in. Um, our first topic will be the cash bail system. Um, I'm gonna try to speed through my questions to give you guys time uh, to answer. Um, so with the cash bail system, uh, which effectively um, criminalizes uh, poverty and uh, stricken people uh, who can't afford to uh, pay for their bail. Uh, we all know that Governor Cuomo's recent budget eliminated cash bail for most misdemeanor and less serious felonies, but not all offenses. Um, some say the new law doesn't go far enough. Some says it goes too far. Um, we've all heard those different things. Um, so would you go beyond the new cash bail system and eliminate cash bail for all ex offenses? Um, if not, what would be the specific criteria where you would consider uh, determining when to seek bail? And if you do plan to eliminate altogether, how would you avoid um, all the pretrial detention um, where people just sit in jail and they wait for trial? Um, and then lastly, um, no matter what your position, your position is on this, uh, we don't really want to hear it's kind of case by case. We all understand that. Um, but no matter what you say, how would you then deal with the pretrial uh, detention of so many different people who, you know, obviously lose out on family time, jobs, and all of those things that we know? Um, so kind of a three-part question. This time we'll start uh, opposite. Yep. Yes, I will end cash bail for all offenses, felony and mis misdemeanor offenses. I don't believe that anyone should be incarcerated. Anyone should be languishing in an incarcerated state f just because they can't afford to buy their freedom. I don't think that's justice, and coming from a disadvantaged community, I've seen a lot of my family, my friends incarcerated, and I've seen how the poor t tend to be marginalized in our criminal justice system. I wanna fight against that, and that's why I became a, a district attorney, that's why I became a prosecutor, because I knew as a young man, if you, if you wanted to change the system, you had to get in the game. You had to get into the system to change it from within, and that's exactly what I did. And for 18 years, that's what I've been doing. I've been diverting ca cases from the criminal justice system. I've been, I've been not you abusing um, cash bail or any type of other bail. And the way I'm gonna do it is simple. We have laws in the books that allows us to not go into cash bail at all. We have appearance bonds, unsecured, partially secured, and fully secured. We can allow an individual to be released to the custody of their family, their loved ones, who can vouch for them. We can have, we can have employers vouch for their employees saying that they'll return to, to, to court. So we don't need to put people in, in jail that 
you know, can't afford to pay cash and it's languished there. We can have ways of doing it and we don't have to always resort to what's the easiest uh, outcome, which was just set bail. That's, that's what, you know, the criminal justice system has just been too lazy about it because the judges, the prosecutors have, re you know, defaulted to this end. And I won't do that when, as district attorney. Thank you. So just a quick, just a quick follow up. Um, so if the judge do try to, you know, like I said, create that pretrial detain, uh, detainment part, how would you try to deal with that to, to take that away from judges having the ability to do that? This is where the partnership between the defense and the prosecution goes a long way. We can partner up with the defense counsel to talk to the judge to on the record and off the record and tell them what are the circumstances, what are the mitigating, extenuating circumstances, what is the circumstance of this individual and why bail, cash bail, is not appropriate in his case. Maybe because he has a family in the courtroom and, they, and they'll take custody of him because if he's a young man, he lives with them. Maybe it's because the, the, the husband or the wife is in the, is in the courtroom and they'll take you know, custody and ensure his return to court. The only reason we have bail is to ensure the person's rec uh, return to court at a future date. It's not to punish, it's not to, to, to you know, marginalize. That's the purpose of it. Thank you. Do we want to continue? You can see, yeah, continue. We definitely need to end cash bail for all types of cases. Bail basically ensures that a person is supposed to return to court, and we have other alternatives and methods that we can use to make sure that a person will return to court without having to impose monetary bail on them. And that goes all up and down from misdemeanor offenses all the way up to felony offenses. We need to remember people like Khalif Browder and Jerome Murdo, the homeless Marine War veteran who was incarcerated for sleeping in a public housing stairwell, arrested for trespass, jailed, and held on bail, and couldn't pay it because he was homeless. And so we need to be looking at those types of cases and remembering what, what we're trying to accomplish here, what was bail meant to do. It's meant to make sure that a person returns to court. And so we can achieve this system even here in New York. I came from a jurisdiction DC ended cash bail in 1992. And basically, 94% of people who were released in DC, 90% of them returned to court. So we can achieve this even here in New York City and put an end to cash bail and look at other alternative means. Um, just wanna let you guys know, this is Betty Lugo. Um, you. Did, you, did you hear the question? I don't know when you watched Cash bail question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we just talked about um, whether you would eliminate it, um, and if not, um, what would be the specific criteria when you would seek it, and if so, um, how would you deal with the pretrial detention? Okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, and, and thank you all for being here at this forum. My name is Betty Lugo. I've been a lawyer for 35 years. I was the first Latina in the Nassau County District Attorney's Office. That's a... Uh, woman of Hispanic heritage. My parents came from Puerto Rico. Um, my mother came with a fourth grade education and uh, I was born in Elmhurst Hospital, raised in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. While the odds were against me, I started the first Hispanic woman-known law firm in New York at One World Trade Center. And uh, the firm is still going strong 27 years later and I'm proudly running for Queens District Attorney. As to the question of cash bail, it goes back to my law school days. There was a great judge, Judge Bruce Wright. They used to call him, let him loose Bruce. This was back in 1984. So this cash bail situation has been going on for many years. What have our politicians done? What has our legislature done? Nothing. Judge Bruce Wright, who passed away, whose son is Keith Wright, assemblyman from Harlem, um, they, and he also has a, sit, a judge who sits. But this has been going on since 1984. As a Latina, and as a, one of you, look at me, my, I am you. I am a, a, a Puerto Rican woman, minority woman, raised in a tough neighborhood. I know both the prosecution and defense, we should not have cash bail, but let's make it stick. We've been running this, we've been talking about this, way before 1984 with Judge Bruce Wright. Let's make it happen now. No cash bail. So I grew up, um, it was me and my mom in our little rent-stabilized apartment. And my mom was a waitress. 
some weeks the tips were good and some weeks they weren't. So we were on public assistance. That's how we were able to survive. <clears throat> if my mom had gotten in trouble, found herself before a judge, and the judge just threw out $500 bail or $1,000 bail, as they often do, she would have been able to pay it. Because for us, $500 might have been $5 million. Just a <coughs> few miles from here, on Rikers Island, there are thousands of people who have not been convicted of anything at all, who are sitting in jail only because they do not have the money in their pocket to pay cash bail. So that is why I have long opposed cash bail under any circumstance whatsoever. It's why in the council we have funded the expansion of supervised release funds, uh, supervised release programs. We have funded a New York City bail fund that actually pays bail for people who can't afford it. As district attorney, I will not ask for cash bail ever. I will make sure that most people are released on their own recognizance. Most people return to court when they're supposed to. Some people will be under some kind of supervised release program where maybe they have to check in every week or every few weeks, or maybe they get a text message or an email reminding them of their court appearance, which, believe it or not, is actually very effective in getting people to come back to court. And in those small, small circumstances where someone poses a danger to society, a specific threat, then they, like as they are today, will be remanded awaiting for their day in court. But fundamentally, cash bail is immoral, it's evil, nobody should be sitting in jail because they're poor. Just a, a quick follow-up. Um, what would be some situation where you said like someone would have to check in maybe once a week, or like what, what do you see as a situation where you would decide that? Sure. So, so the main um, reason that, that bail is set, and under New York law, actually the only reason that it's allowed to be set, if someone presents a flight risk. There's a risk that they will not return to court. So if someone has a history of flight risk or a history of, of, of missing a court appearance, those individuals might be appropriate for a supervised release. So they have to check in, or they have to be checked, uh, uh, checked up on um, to make sure that they return to court. But it will be based on their individual experience of having missed prior court appearances. The goal is to have the least onerous burden on people as possible so that they can go and make their court appearances Sorry. and go about their life. Yeah. Appreciate it. We need to get rid of um, cash bail in the state of New York. Now, what the legislature did was got rid of bail for misdemeanors, cash bail for misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies. And I think that's a great first step. But we can't have any cash bail in our system because clearly that's just a punishment for the poor. 78% of the people sitting on Rikers right now have never been tried for a case. They are awaiting trial. And that's a travesty that is happening in our city. We need to make sure that we strengthen our community-based organizations so while people are waiting at trial, they can not only get mental health services, but drug abuse addiction services, homeless services, workforce services, and all that comes with not ending up back in our criminal justice system. And We've already been working with a lot of the cure violence groups, a lot of the uh, mental health clinics, a lot of the drug clinics, working on uh, gun violence issues in our communities. But if you do cash bail and spend, send people all the way to Rikers before they've even been tried, the idea of them coming back into the system is multiplied enormously. So the way I would do it is I would have no cash bail, those that could be that should be remanded are very few and should be the last choice alternative but there is a middle ground that i believe in i believe there's people who are getting sent to rikers who would benefit more from supervised release into one of the cure violence programs i believe there's those that are going to rikers right now who are actually doing time who would benefit more from a drug abuse clinic or for mental health services or for homeless services, why were they committing the crimes? Were they trying to put food on their table or were they trying to put a roof over their head? Why don't we figure it out? And to say that everyone who only is doing misdemeanors or nonviolent felons or those that we really know are not gonna show back in court and that there's no middle ground that, that we can be helpful so they up. never come back, 
I think that there's a lot more we can do. Thank you. I commit to never asking for cash bail. It creates two systems. This idea that it's okay um, to not have cash bail for low-level offenses, but it's okay to have it for violent, just says to our communities that the poor remain remanded, incarcerated, while the rich get to buy their presumption of innocence, something that's constitutionally protected, right? Um, but beyond that, we should be releasing folks to the fullest extent of the law and saying, hey, give them what they need to stabilize their lives and ensure that they come back to court. And that means making sure that we do everything we can to get them there, whether it is supportive services, whether it is simply a, a, a phone. What the bail funds have done and shown us is that overwhelmingly people come back to court when you simply give them a phone, <coughs> give them text messages, metro cards to get to where they're going, access to the services that they need. I would be wary even of saying, hey, going forward, we look at some of these bench warrant histories because in fact, what I know as a public defender is a lot of times barriers to getting to court sometimes are uh, the, the choice between keeping your housing at the shelter, right? Or getting um, your methadone at the clinic or all of these other things. And the one thing that I wanna point out as well as being really important is how we figure out who we release and under what conditions. We cannot use these risk score algorithms that are based in the same racist and classist um, ideas that our entire system is based in. We have to be very wary of that. We shouldn't be going to e-carceration and over-supervising in ways that promote technical violations that end up landing the same black and brown and low income communities back into, um, into the prison industrial complex. And beyond that, in the very minuscule number of cases where somebody is remanded, then it is incumbent on the DA to say, we're gonna hand over the evidence right away, we're gonna not play any games with speedy trial, and we're gonna resolve these cases, whether it is a disposition or a trial, as soon as possible, because to detain somebody pre-trial before they're proven guilty of anything is wrong. Thank you. Uh, just a just a quick follow up. Do you do you see um, a situation where you do um, expect to have cash bail, whether it's like you said, flight risk or something? Do you see that? No, there is never uh, an appropriate uh, instance where cash bail should be set. Again, we can't make this distinction. So we're saying that low level and nonviolent offenses, we won't have cash bail. Um, and everybody gets out, the wealthy, the poor. But then when there is a violent crime, for example, we still allow the wealthy to, again, buy their presumption of innocence, something that is constitutionally protected, and then poor folks stay incarcerated. And it destabilizes not just their life, but their family members' lives, and it's a generational impact, right? And a lot of times when somebody isn't detained pretrial, Overwhelmingly, those cases end in dismissals, violations, misdemeanors, whereas if you're incarcerated, you're gonna end up with a felony. Thank you. So moving on to the next topic, um, we'll talk about diversion. Uh, I wanna talk about the ways to keep people out of the system, such as declining to prosecute certain offenses in the first place and diverting people into treatment away from criminal convictions. Such policies have shown to prevent people from committing future crimes by addressing the root causes of their, of their offenses. They also help avoid the life altering consequences of the criminal conviction and being incarcerated. Where specific offenses would you have strong presumption of declining prosecution, if any? Similarly, similarly what offenses would you categorize as a divert treatment or rehabilitative uh, programs? Um, and then, what specific criteria would you use when determining whether to di divert or decline a case? Um, again, like I said earlier, we're looking for really specific uh, answers and how to deal with this. Um, and this, this kind of addresses uh, certain category, not just crime, but also uh, recreational drug use uh, beyond marijuana. Um, to, I hope everyone's happy with this, but to keep everything moving in the same direction, we'll go back to alphabetical order. Um, but this time, we'll just start uh, with you, Miss Katz, and we'll skip one. I've known, I've seen that the, the more we mix it up, the better. No problem. So, diversion is one area where you need to have a history of doing it in this borough in order to make it successful on January 1st when you become the district attorney. 
I, as the borough president, have been working with community groups over the entire borough of Queens on diversion programs already. We've been working with so many of them on cure violence programs. We've been doing mental health or disorders. We've been doing uh, drug rehab programs. And we've actually been doing it very successfully. And you know, we were talking before about what happens if a judge doesn't buy in to what you're asking to do, because we can make a motion in front of a judge and then they have to figure it out. But this is where leadership comes in handy. So if you have a history of doing cure violence, if you have a history like I do as the borough president of Queens of sealing convictions already for those that have convictions that are over 10 years old and working with the Legal Aid Society and all of the different partners that are already in play on the ground, then you have a little more credibility on January 1st to work with the bench and to work with the other partners uh, as we divert people from the system. We did warrant forgiveness programs. 200 people showed up when the DA did it. When my name was on it, over 500 people showed up because they knew that it would be safe territory once they showed with the borough president's name on it. When we have young people who commit offenses on drugs, we need to make sure they're getting the help they need. When we have young people who would rather pick up a gun and join a gang instead of feeling safe without a gun, that is a major consequence that we are facing every single day here in the borough of Queens. Diversion programs are the things that are going to keep our young people out of the system so there is not a mark for the rest of their life. And you know I'm gonna do it as the DA, because I've done it as the borough president. So you want criminal justice reform, have someone who can put people at the table, make it happen, have people have the confidence in the leadership of that person because they've already done the diversion programs. Thank you. When I, when I say the criminal justice system is racist, what I mean is it's created this, this new Jim Crow where every year across the country, and in Queens as well, thousands of people, black and brown, are put through the criminal justice system for these low-level offenses, because, as I said, the criminalization of mental illness, addiction, and poverty. Given criminal records for the rest of their lives, they make it hard to get a job, to get housing, to get an education. So the first thing we need to do is keep people out of the criminal justice system who shouldn't be in the criminal justice system. That's why in the council we have decriminalized low-level, nonviolent quality of life offenses that have kept hundreds of thousands of people out of the criminal justice system in the first place. We pressured the district attorneys to vacate old warrants so people, the next time they have an interaction with a police officer, even if it's a traffic stop, they don't end up in handcuffs and off to uh, central booking. But for people who do get arrested, if you have a mental illness, you should get treatment. And you should not be forced to plead guilty first before you have access to that treatment. If you have a drug addiction, if the cause of, of what brought you into the criminal justice system is poverty, these are things that shouldn't be in the criminal justice system in the first place. So we've expanded in the city council funding for diversion programs across the board. We have special diversion courts in Queens that relate to mental illness, to um, addiction issues to human trafficking, women, uh, mostly women who are charged with prostitution offenses. We give them services instead of jail time. We even have a diversion court for veterans so that they can get their particular needs um, examined and evaluated and treated without going through the criminal justice system. We need, to stop de we need to stop criminalizing the social problems and social challenges that we have in this city, in this country, and get them out of the criminal justice system and get people the help and the treatment that they need. I grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant. My mother had a small business and everybody, all the factory workers and everybody in the neighborhood would come to her. Doña Juanita, please help me. My kid is in jail. This happened, that happened. I have personal, first-hand knowledge of not only being a victim of crime, but having a family who's been a victim of crime and my brother who has been a defendant, and so has my uncle. So I have personal, first-hand knowledge. I am you. My brother, meth heroin, methadone, now has liver cancer after serving as a Vietnam vet. My father and my uncle, both Korean War vets, Borinqueneers, but also alcohol issues. Now, what do we say about this? 
No matter what programs, and everybody up here could talk about programs, let me tell you about programs. If you don't have the right programs with the right people in there, you're not gonna give people help because you know how our people are. We're very proud. We don't, what if you send somebody to a program and they don't go? Then what do you do, violation of probation? Another ticket? So we need to make sure that these programs have diversity and inclusion. You can't send a Latina or a Latino who suffered domestic violence to Safe Horizon with a white therapist. I'm sorry, you just can't. They don't understand the language, they don't understand the culture, it's not gonna work, okay? And including, the, uh, you know, blacks, Asians, whatever, if, if you send a Chinese person to a Puerto Rican therapist, it's not gonna work. So somebody has to fix this. And it's a whole process, and it's, it takes a village. The community has to come together with the faith-based leaders in our community and make sure that we have Latino social workers, Asian social, social workers, black social workers, people that understand the culture, understand the community, and that they're gonna get respected, that you're gonna respect the victim, you're gonna respect the defendant, and they're gonna respect you in return. Otherwise, these programs are not gonna work. We can talk about program, 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 but they have to be properly equipped. And it's not about putting the whites first and saying, okay, we, we get all the money and everybody else gets you know, $15 an hour because, uh, I'm sorry, you're a minority, so we're gonna give you $15, like make the road, okay? The white people, got, excuse, they make all gotta, the money and then nobody you. gets, everybody else gets $15 an hour. We got, so we got, a, got a quick follow up, uh, 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, what specific charges would you divert or decline? All low-level offenses. I don't believe that low-level drug, cocaine, marijuana, heroin, if it's for your personal use, hey, that's prevalent in our communities. It's too bad. You keep on prosecuting that, you go to jail, you're gonna see all the young Latino, black and brown brothers and sisters in jail. Let's not prosecute low-level drugs. What for? What for? They're gonna come back and forth. So, and um, petty larceny, uh, criminal trespass, Thank anything that it not, does not involve violence, I would not prosecute. Thank you. Thank you. So as special counsel to the Brooklyn DA, Ken Thompson, we came up with the first in the nation marijuana possession decriminalization policy where we decided we were not going to prosecute low level marijuana possession offenses. And as district attorney for Queens, I would not only do that in Queens, I would also take it further. Gravity knives for one. Usually people are in possession of gravity knives in Queens because they need them for their jobs. They're construction workers, or they work in a factory, or they work in a warehouse. Yet if they're caught with a gravity knife, they get arrested for having a gravity knife and it's a criminal offense. Prostitution is another one that I wouldn't, I wouldn't prosecute. We need to stop prosecuting these low-level criminal offenses that do nothing but saddle people with a criminal conviction that affect their ability to get a job, to get housing, to get a loan, sometimes even their ability to get a license. It's unfair and it affects lower income communities and black and brown communities even more. The other thing that I would do is we're talking about diversion courts. As Deputy Attorney General, I implemented a mental health community court and also expanded drug treatment court. We also started a restorative justice initiative so that people wouldn't get saddled in the criminal justice space and have criminal convictions, where we tried to work with the offender and the victim to make them whole again and to make sure that the harm wasn't repeated in the future. And that's what we need to do in Queens County. With the current diversion courts that exist, I understand that they may have been existing for a long time. But sometimes we actually need a fresh eye to come in and look at it objectively and see how successful these courts really are. Where's the data? Where's the data on how successful these courts really are that are currently in existence in Queens County? As district attorney, I would look into how successful they are, do a full and comprehensive evaluation, and see how we can make them more effective and more efficient so that we can make sure that the citizens of Queens County are getting the treatment that they deserve. Thank you. As district attorney, I will decline to prosecute sex work and related offenses, gravity knife offenses, trespass, uh, fair beating, 
these are all criminalizing three things. They're criminalizing poverty, drug addiction, and they're criminalizing already marginalized people in our society, and we need to stop doing that. What I want to do, I want to focus on, uh, on prosecuting violent crime. So that the, in order to do that, you have to divert the low-level offenses away from the criminal justice system. And when I say divert, I mean really divert. In Brooklyn and, and, st and other counties in Manhattan, we have a project called the Clear Project, where in, they don't even come to court. The individuals that get arrested and, and charged with, with criminal possession of, of narcotics, they don't even come to court. Social workers go to the precinct and counsel them and put them in services and they don't even have a case against them. That's the type of criminal justice system that I wanna see happen because why, once you create a case on it, it follows them. It follows them for the rest of their life. So they should be diverted, not even in the courtroom, outside in the precinct where they can be diverted by a social worker into services. And not only would I do that, uh, you know, we've we seen it so many times before, a young man uh, of color, you know, nine times out of ten coming from a disadvantaged community, can't get a job in the union, can't get a job with the city. Why? Because of a, a fair beat. And, and we have to expunge these arrests. We have to expunge these convictions so that these individuals have access to school, has access to education, have access to jobs, and have access to the licenses they need to succeed in life. So, you know, yeah, I'm gonna decline to prosecute. I'm gonna, divert every, I'm gonna divert from the criminal justice system. And the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna make sure every individual is evaluated. I'm no longer gonna have a DA's office, which is what happens in Queens now. They pick and choose who gets evaluated. Everyone gets evaluated if they have an issue. Everyone, it's an assessment of what their issues are, whether it be mental health il illness, whether it be drug addiction, whether it be poverty, whether it be gangs. But we have to assess the person first in order to get those services to them. Thank you. So I'm going to start by talking about what I would decline. Decline transit offenses, trespasses, uh, gravity knives. A lot of people don't know that if you are charged with a gravity knife and you have any criminal record, a fair beat even, a uh, marijuana possession, that can be charged as a felony with mandatory minimum upstate prison time. And that gets weaponized against the very communities that have historically been over-criminalized and, and over-prosecuted. Um, beyond that, when we talk about the goal is public safety. Uh, this is about saving lives. So of course, we will decline to prosecute all recreational drug use, right? So that we have access to harm reduction services because harm reduction and decriminalization saves lives. So that's why we do it. The same with sex work. Um, a difference in opinion on all recreational dr uh, drugs and the, the details matter here. Um, with the other candidates, but also when it comes to sex work. Full decriminalization. You have to uh, decriminalize sex workers and customers because it saves lives. It creates an environment that allows sex workers access to health care and law enforcement support and um, frees them from the dangers of, of abuse and trafficking. That's how you target trafficking. There should be a presumption for diversion. How many times can we go into a system throwing people in jail and say, Jail isn't working, but you're throwing them back into jail. Somebody struggles in a program, and they never get a second chance at a program. Yet, jail doesn't work, but we keep going with that. But we have to change the way we view diversion and partner with our community-based organizations because they do the work better than we ever could. Queens has $100 million worth of federal asset forfeiture money. Along with the money that we invest in our prison industrial complex, over 140000 to incarcerate somebody for a year, that can be used to partner with our communities who do better work than the DA's office ever could and free up our own resources to focus on more serious crimes. Thank you. And um, just a follow-up across the board um, for everyone. Um, so all you obviously said that you would divert and decline, um, but how will we get there? You know, obviously we said if someone has a history, if they've been arrested numerous times um, for drug use or maybe what is suspected to be mental, issue, mental issues, but how will we determine if someone's first arrested in their first offense? Um, how will you kind of teach your ADAs to go out there and to be able to prosecute but understand, you know, the different signs of a mental illness? We know when... Um, the, uh, the communities that don't have money, you don't get help. So you might not have any record of mental illness or drug use because you're not seeking help. Um, how would you teach uh, that once you go out in the community? We can start with you, Tiffany. Sure, so as a public defender, um, I am aware of some of the mechanisms that are in place that the DA could be working with. 
too often the DA is adversarial for the sake of being adversarial. So when somebody comes in and is waiting to be seen by a judge, waiting to see their offense attorney, they're actually screened uh, by a unit that can flag different mental health um, issues, different substance use issues, because one, they wanna make sure um, folks that might be detoxing get the health care they need, need, but they write letters right there and they hand it over to the defense attorney and we read them and we communicate them to the DA. So DAs and, and defense attorneys have an opportunity to be working together because again, when we talk about the goal being public safety and stability equaling, equaling public safety and giving people the things that they need, then you know that more often than not, you should be working together and not adversarial. The information's there. You can train them, but also it's a team effort and we should be working as a team. So every single bureau chief, ADA, and investigator should be trained to get the signs of mental illness. And anyone that's even questionable after all the training should go for assessment before we even continue going through the criminal justice system. I think it is crucial to do that for anyone who shows any signs. I want to go back, if I can, just because it's the same question. You know, we have diversion right now in the city of New York, in Manhattan, in the Bronx, and in Staten Island for actually uh, arrests for controlled substance in the seventh degree. And that includes many, many drugs, not just marijuana. It includes opioids. It includes, it includes heroin. And the problem with that is that it's at the DA's discretion, and we don't do it here in the borough of Queens. So we need to divert folks into drug rehab anytime we can, and on January 1st, we need to join that citywide program that Queens chose not to be in. It, it starts with fundamentally changing the culture of the district attorney's office, and that starts with the district attorney who understands that um, the responsibility of the district attorney is not to lock up people, it's not merely to process the cases that the police bring, but it's to be the chief public safety official for the borough of Queens. And public safety is much, much more than just locking people up. So we've got the long list of offenses that we're going to decline to prosecute. But you need to train the assistants, the, the, the leadership of the district attorney's office. You need to have more than just investigators and prosecutors. You need to have social workers. You need to have partnerships with organizations like the Fortune Society, you know, right up the road here. There are organizations that we work with in the council that are dedicated to providing people with alternatives to incarceration. And they need to be made a part of the district attorney's office, not some separate uh, organization or some separate place that's separate and, f and apart okay, from what up. the district attorney does. Thank you. I would have a diversity and inclusion unit and a community relations unit, and this unit would be responsible for providing health and wellness classes to all my staff to all the assistant DAs, to the investigators, to all the personnel, as well as mandatory diversity and implicit bias training. It is now for lawyers mandatory to have at least one credit of diversity training because believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, we still discriminate. We may appear that we don't, but we do. And um, we need to educate everyone. So I would also institute, like a boy and girls club, I would make sure that every assistant DA and everybody that works in my office goes to a less fortunate neighborhood, a tough neighborhood, and not only inspire and mentor people of color, minorities, to seek a profession in, in the legal or whatever other profession they want, but to let them know that they're a role model. I've mentored so many young people, Mexicans, blacks, Asians, they're now lawyers, they're now accountants, because I know I didn't make it here on my own. I stand on the shoulders of giants, just like Charlie Chisholm, whose campaign I worked on when I was a kid. You can't stand on the sidelines just like football. You got to be in the game, and that's why I'm here, because I want to lift up my community. I've lifted on. up a lot of people, and I will continue to do it. Thank you. Anytime that you're trying to implement culture change in a large government organization, it is not easy. You, pr you usually and probably get the most pushback from implementing culture change from within, not outside, from within. So as district attorney who has done, as a district attorney and someone who has actually implemented culture change in three government organizations already, what I would do is to make sure that the DA's office and all of its employees are trained properly. 
The Queens District Attorney's Office has a CLE session that is mandated for every single assistant district attorney to take. As part of this culture change, I would make sure that they're trained in substance use disorder as well as mental health issues because I think it's important that when you have cases involving substance use disorder and mental health issues, the person assigned to the case, the prosecutor assigned to the case needs to understand what that disorder and what those mental health issues are and how it manifests itself in behavior and how we can better look at the case holistically. We need to look Thank at you. people, not cases. On. Thank you. This is where experience trumps political rhetoric. I've been doing this for my, with my career for over 18 years. I've been doing diversion. I've been doing the implicit bias training. We've been doing this in other offices for years. It just hasn't happened in Queens. And that's what's important to realize. You need to experience to see what, what looks right and then implement it. I have that experience and the fact of the matter is what I will do is implement implicit bias training, cultural sensitivity training. But the first thing that I have to do is not only change the culture, is change the face of the office. Make sure it's diverse. Make sure it's as diverse as the Queens County population make sure that the, the the whatever the diversion is that we have or, or, or the you know recruitment program program we have that it's recruiting diverse individuals so I'll commit to hiring a chief diversity officer officer that not only recruit uh, minorities into the office but also make sure that we track their careers so they get promoted into promotion into into leadership positions into executive positions that's why that's that's what Thank we need you. because we the entire right. office has to be diverse Thank you. I'm um, moving on to uh, charging and sentencing. Um, let's talk about uh, reducing the amount of time people spend in prison um, based off charges and sentences the district attorney's office chooses to seek. Um, over 40 years, criminal sentencing has become increasingly disconnected from promoting public safety. Prosecutors have used extreme sentencing, such as minimum mandatory penalties and sentencing enhancements to send people to prison for decades. Um, the result is, massive, is a massive system of incarceration, which research reveals serves little measurable crime reducing purpose and causes substantial harm to individuals, family members, and communities that are affected. Um, district attorneys have a very unique opportunity uh, to affect the outseas prison and jail population by addressing incarceration of people convicted of both serious and minor offenses. Um, like we talked about early, uh, the district attorney has a lot of power in that. Um, so obviously there's a lot of reform proposals um, that are focused on misdemeanor and low-level offenders, but do you plan to responsibly, responsibly reduce population of people sorry, incarcerated uh, for more serious offenses? If so, what specific steps will you take to do that? Um, if not, what will you do to address the occurrence of violence in Queens without resorting to the same tough on crime policies that led to mass incarceration in the first place. We are back, right, exactly, Mr. Lansman. Thank you. Thank you. So there are two aspects to mass incarceration. When we talk about mass incarceration, we talk about, as I said before, the new Jim Crow, that people get sucked into the criminal justice system for these low level offenses, these drug offenses, they really shouldn't be in the criminal justice system at all. And a mass of people, they may not spend a long time in jail, but they've got criminal records for the rest of their lives. The other aspect of mass incarceration, which is the a really difficult one for people to talk about, is the people who are actually sitting in jail. The jails in New York State, the prisons in New York State, are filled not with people who have been convicted of low-level offenses, but of people who have been convicted of serious offenses. And if you really want to reduce the prison population, as we must, you have to confront what do you do with people who have committed serious crimes, violent crimes. Should people be sitting in prison 30, 40 years, long past the point where they would be any danger to society? <coughs> Should people be sitting in prison and every time they have a parole hearing coming up, the district attorney automatically opposes their release on parole? Should we be squeezing people by using mandatory minimums into pleading guilty to charges, to offenses that they didn't commit, but they don't want to take the risk of getting hit with that huge 25 to life or life without parole sentence? That's what the system does to people. So as district attorney, 
we are going to charge people and seek sentences that are at the lowest that are necessary to keep people safe. We're not going to seek life without parole for anybody. It doesn't mean that someone may not end up spending the rest of their life in prison, but everybody should have at least the opportunity after a term of years to make their case to a parole board. I support the proposal that after someone has served, I think it's 15 years in prison, they get an opportunity to have their sentence reviewed based on what they've done, their, with their rehabilitation in prison, et cetera. We have to confront we got violent offenses and include people who've committed violent offenses Thank in you. criminal justice reform. I believe in giving somebody a second and third chance. I believe in a firm but fair prosecution. There should be true justice for all with compassion and mercy. Everybody should be given a second chance. Nobody's perfect. We're all human beings trying to live in a very tough society these days. Now, mass incarceration is a big issue. But when I was trained as an assistant DA in Nassau County, believe it or not, while it should have been conservative, I was trained not to ask for bail. The DA never took a position on sentencing. They would leave it up to the judge. I have worked as the former chair, currently, of the Puerto Rican Bar Association and the past president of the Puerto Rican Bar Association, and I have sat on many judicial screening committees pushing for diversity on the judiciary. Because until you have a diverse judiciary, you're not going to have fairness in our system, believe it or not. So if you don't have a judiciary that reflects our communities, how are they going to know? If they've walked in your shoes, they know. The judges up there know. And they are more lenient on sentencing. I will not take a position on sentencing. But I will have often many meetings with the judiciary to discuss issues, especially of minority communities and of the many different communities that there are in Queens. Let's take it to the faith-based leaders. Let's the community organizations get involved. I'll have a mediation process. Instead of making a young person go through the criminal justice system and get a career, I'll mediate a violation of a crime. Let's have retired judges sit on criminal cases and mediate that issue and try to resolve it. Family disputes, criminal trespass, anything that's not violent. Why take it through the criminal justice system? No need. Save that money for the violent crimes. Save it for the real crimes and let our criminal justice system be reflective of our community. That's why I continue to push. Here in Queens, two Hispanic women became judges last year. That's because I fought. It took us a long time. First Puerto on. Rican female judge in Queens. Yeah. Last year, after so many years, Thank you, we, we you got, got the first right. judge. We need judiciary diversity. So obviously we can continue to decarcerate our jails and prisons by not prosecuting the low-level offenses that do nothing to impact public safety and do nothing but saddle people with a criminal conviction. But we can take it further than that. Obviously, we had discussions already about not criminalizing poverty, not criminalizing people with mental health issues, not criminalizing those with substance use disorder. And if we deal with those three areas and we provide services and treatment instead of incarceration, certainly we will be decreasing the amount of people in the population of our jails and prisons. But I also think there's another side to this. And what we need to remember is that we need to keep our communities safe and whole and make sure that we are protecting people who need to pre be protected and make sure that we stand up for victims as well. Not only for people who are accused of crimes, but also for victims. So some of you may not be old enough to remember the Wendy's massacre that happened in Flushing at a Wendy's restaurant, but seven people were shot at execution style by two men. And we need to remember that in, in the light of doing criminal justice reform, we also need to keep our community safe. There are some people that need to be outside of our communities so that we can live our lives and go to work and go to school without worrying about being killed, robbed, or anything else. You know, the key to address uh, excessive sentencing is to work to, you, to the beginning of the process. Excessive sentencing is caused by overcharging. This is when experience matters. You have to know the system and how to charge a case. You have to charge a case in, a, in an appropriate way so it fits the law and the evidence. 
And when you overcharge a case, what happens is and when you get to sentencing, you end up with these mandatory minimums. So you have to be able to know what's the difference between an overcharge case and a not. And I think that the key to, to, to ending excessive sen sentencing is to make sure that the, the DAs are trained not to overcharge cases, to charge cases appropriately, capture the, the, the misconduct, and that's it. Now, as far as divergence, you know, stopping mass incarceration, I, I, I have five point plan easily. You, de you decline to prosecute low level offenses. You divert whenever possible. You provide discovery at the first op opportunity in a case. You, tr you don't game the system and you don't play with the ready rule. And then ultimately you, you play fair. You make sure that you're cooperating with the judge and with the defense counsel to make sure justice is done. Because as a district attorney, you're a minister of justice and that should be your goal. Your goal should not be to charge and incarcerate. Your goal must be to do justice in every case, regardless of the circumstances. And for, for individuals who have prior convictions, I'm not gonna have automatic sentencing requirements for, for individuals with, with prior convictions. I think you have to look at the circumstances of the, of the person accused of a crime and then look at the impact on the community of the, of the sentence. So you have to look at the full picture. If we want to end mass incarceration and reform our criminal justice system, we cannot limit reforms to low-level nonviolent offenses. And something that you learn when you are in court every single day is that one week you're the defendant, one week you're the witness, and the next week you're the victim. And so when we talk about public safety and who we need to keep safe, we need to be looking at it on a large scale in terms of our entire community. And you know that when the goal is public safety for all of our communities, then we should be proactive, not reactive. So we invest in things like the Cure Violence model that attacks gun violence by investing in our communities, allowing our communities to take ownership, not involving the police and interrupting violence before it escalates. Gun violence goes down by upwards of 30 to 40%. Mm -hmm. But I think your question was about serious offenses and longer prison sentences. And what we have to start doing is changing those metrics of success and say forget about the numbers of convictions and lengths of sentences and just say how do we make sure the harm doesn't happen again? How do we keep our community safe? And when you disincentivize that length of sentence, that conviction metric, and just say, we just don't want this to happen again, then you come at it from a place where you're not demanding the maximum times, right? You go in saying, I'm going to, to look for the minimum it's going to take to change behavior. I'm gonna look to support that person so that they don't come out and harm somebody again. So what I would do to reform that is say, district attorneys typically have to start from the top and then have to get approval to go down and get lower, lower plea deals. It should be inverted. District attorneys should be presuming below the mandatory minimums and services, and when they think it's appropriate for something different, they go up the ladder to make their case for that. We need to start empowering DAs from the beginning on the ground, the people who know their line ADAs, who know their case better than anyone else, to start making decisions about cases rather than having supervisors, 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 three people removed that know the least amount of information about a case making the most consequential decisions in a person's life. One of the reasons to end cash bail is because we have a lot of folks in the state that are actually pleading to higher crimes because they can't afford the bail. So they're sitting in Rikers for as long as they are and then someone comes and says, well, if you plead to this crime and you get more time than you would at a trial, will make sure that you move forward at least, but they can't afford it. So that ends up in mass incarceration throughout the state of New York. A few years ago, we had the Rockefeller drug laws here in the state, and they were putting people in jail for low-level offenses, and we amended those laws because of uh, lobbying up in Albany day after day, and we did not let up. And finally, those laws were changed to allow people out of jail that were in there for low-level uh, drug, drug offenses. But let me tell you, this is not just about how to get people out of jail early, because I do agree with the 55 years. You turn 55 years, you've served 15 years in the prison system, you should be able to get your case heard again by a parole board or by whoever it is that has to let you out if you have actually been rehabilitated. But this is also about the time that you're spending in our prison system. There are inadequate drug abuse um, programs that are happening in our system. There is absolutely little training that is going on in our system. We have solitary confinement 
and virtually no standards and no laws to dictate when you need to let someone out of solitary confinement. And then once you let them out of solitary confinement and they're angry and they haven't gotten the services they need and they have been hungry and they've had nobody around them for as long as it's been, and then you say, well, look, you're still not behaving right. Of course you're not because you haven't had the services that you need in order to be able to have good behavior. We are torturing people there. So yes, we should end cash bail so we don't have plea bargains because people can't afford the bail. We should make sure that the ADAs, by the way, and you have to know how to run a 530 person office, we should make sure that the ADAs do the lowest amount of time necessary for each crime and get permission by the DAs to go on a higher level, not the opposite. Thank you. A, a quick, a quick, quick follow-up um, in that, uh, how you spoke about cash bail again. What offenses would you just, you know, decline and divert within that when you talk about mass incarceration? I, I, well, I would divert clearly what the state legislature has ordered for January 1st, 2020, and that will come in the exact same day that we all come into office. But, you know, my issue is that there's those that will get no cash bail automatically and get ROR and they'll be out. And then there are those that commit filing crimes above class D felonies in the state of New York that may benefit from the services that we can provide. And we can talk about programs all we want, but the fact of the matter is we have so many different programs here in the Borough of Queens that I've already been working with day in and day out. Cure violence, life camp, transitional services, mental health, Minquan Center, immigration centers, family justice center, domestic violence, 696 build, intervention for our kids so they don't end up in our system. And I believe that there is a middle ground, that those that aren't remanded and those that aren't automatically ROR'd, that they can actually have supervised release be part of programs that will make their lives better instead Thank of you. doing a bullet at Rikers Island and coming on. out worse. Thank Appreciate you. It. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know if you guys have um, done this before, um, but the next is a, a part that we call the candidate questions. Um, now we're gonna let the candidate ask one question to their opponent, um, not one question each. You get to pick um, who you wanna ask a question to. Um, and the six, you, uh, you obviously have a better understanding of everything going on um, and the issues. Uh, so we want you to be able to ask your opponent a question and you each will have 30 seconds um, to state your question and answer um, in a one minute time. So 30 seconds to ask your question, one minute to answer. Um, and we'll start down at the end this time. Me? Uh, yeah, and the ultimate switch up. My question is for Ms. Caban. Ms. Caban has less than six years experience practicing law, has never led an organization or even a group uh, larger than five people. How is it possible that you can lead an agency of over 600 people when you've never done it in your, in your, in your career or your life? Thanks, Mr. Nevis. Um, I have seven years of uh, experience as a criminal defense lawyer representing over a thousand clients um, on cases from turnstiles to homicides. Beyond that, when we talk about what it takes to bring these kinds of reforms into the office, these are the things, every, the progressive prosecutor, the 21st century prosecutor, uh, these are the things that public defenders have been fighting for on the front lines in court and in Albany for decades. We know them better than anyone. Beyond that, this is about understanding that policies and intended impacts don't always happen in court. And having the knowledge of knowing how to make sure that happens is really important. I have a team, including former career prosecutors with supervisory um, experience that are ready to come into that office with me to help me in the areas where I need I'm not somebody that's going to say I can do this alone. We do it as a team. Beyond that, as a grassroots campaign for a first time candidate, I consider myself the CEO. My campaign manager, the COO. I have over 300 volunteers, a finance director, thank a field you. director, a comms director, Last all sentence, of which please. I manage and do it well. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Mallet. My question is for Ms. Katz. Ms. Katz, you've been the borough president, you voted for the death penalty, 
You have never been involved in criminal justice before until this particular campaign. Can you explain to us your experience in criminal prosecution, in criminal defense, as well as implementing criminal justice reform in a large government agency? Yes, I voted for the death penalty. So many, many of you may not know, is 50 years ago this June, my mother was killed in a drunk driving accident. And I say accident, but she was killed. And when I got to the assembly, there was certain anger issues that I was dealing with at the time. And as I grew and started working on different laws in the legislature, I got the opportunity in the New York City Council 15, 10 years later to be able to actually vote against the death penalty. Because the moment I voted for that, I knew that it was the wrong decision to make. So my entire career has been to stand up for those that don't have a voice. And criminal justice reform, let me tell you how this is gonna go. On January 1st, if you don't have the experience with the cure violence programs in the community, if you don't have the experience working with mental health clinics, if you don't have the experience of working with constituents every single day, if the community of the borough of Queens doesn't trust you the way Last I've earned sentence, the trust, please then you are never gonna make criminal justice happen. And I'm gonna end with this and take prerogative. No, I am not a career prosecutor. I'm not the reason or the Thank cause you. that all of us are up here talking about reform. Thank you. My question is for Rory Lansman. Um, I've worked for diversity in the judiciary, diversity in the legal profession, diversity all around my entire life because I believe that I should lift people up because I had the opportunity and I want more people that look like me. Mr. Lansman, during your career as a city council person or during your entire career, what have you done to mentor people of color and whether anybody has become a lawyer or a judge, of what policy or law have you changed to increase diversity in the legal profession? Thank you. I got it, thank you. Well, the first thing you learn as a lawyer is not to ask a question you don't know the answer to. So I'm very proud to say that with everything else we've talked about tonight, I'm not just talking the talk, I'm walking the walk. The majority of my staff in the city council are people of color. The majority of my staff in the city council are women. As a council member representing one of the most diverse districts in all of New York City, it's only a third white, I've had the opportunity to appoint people of color to the community board in collaboration with our borough president, to hospital boards, to um, uh, engaging people in police precinct uh, community councils, and of course in the council have been a leading advocate for diversity, not just generally, <laughs> but in the legal profession. In fact, we actually had a hearing on the issue of diversity both in the prosecutor's offices and in the public defenders who I also oversee. Diversity is extraordinarily important. People should see that the district attorney's office looks Last like sentence, them please. so that they know that justice is being administered with sensitivity and impartiality. Thank you. You're up now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so I, I will ask a question of the borough president. Um, you know, you voted for the death penalty not once, but twice. And I understand the circumstances of your own upbringing. All of us have had difficult circumstances and challenges. But when we are in a position as public officials, we must be able to rise above them. This wasn't a decision that you made as a college student or a high school student. You were an elected state assembly member. Now that you say that you've had a change of heart, I can't look into your heart and evaluate whether that's true or not. But what I can ask you is, as borough president, why is it that you did not sponsor a single bill in the city council, as is your right as a borough president, on criminal justice reform. Why is it that in the we four, it. on the oh my time, I'm sorry. Yeah. Why is it that as borough president, you never spoke about criminal justice reform in your state of the borough addresses? And why is it as a city council member, when you were a city council member for eight years, you did not sponsor a single bill on criminal justice reform? So people evolve, and part of the problem with the district attorney's office is it hasn't evolved. 
I would venture to say that even Councilman Lanceman has evolved. In the year 2000, he answered a questionnaire, do you support the death penalty? And he answered yes. And I'm assuming, like me, he has worked hard to make sure that he worked on criminal justice issues, that he was in the community doing what he needed to do to make a voice for people who have no voice. But at the end of the day, I have not sponsored a bill in the city count in the uh, borough president's office, and I'm going to tell you why. Because I've actually been doing the work. Because I've been out there sealing convictions with partners all across this borough. And when I went out and did sealing of the convictions for people who had made mistakes over 10 years <coughs> ago, 150 people showed up and got their uh, applications in to seal those convictions. When I did warrant forgiveness programs in the borough of Queens, by the way, over 500 people showed up to get their warrants forgiven. 400 people walked out that day, not having to look Last over their sentence. shoulder every time they got in the car. Why haven't I sponsored legislation as the borough president? Because I've actually been doing the work. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm sorry. I have never, I'd love to see that questionnaire. I have never answered a questionnaire that I supported the death penalty. And in six years as a state we, assembly we member gotta, myself, we gotta move on. where there I'm were sorry. death penalty they bills left no and right, I never signed on to a death penalty bill. Miss so that's, that's just not true. Miss Cash, you're up. You're up for a uh, question. Oh. Um, I, you if know, you would like. So, I didn't even think of a question, but I, I, guess, I guess, Betty, look, Betty, when you were talking about uh, mental health and how we would deal with defendants who uh, came into the system that might have mental health issues, um, can you just talk a little bit about how you would assess that, how you would work on that? and how you would make sure the ADAs actually complied with the training that they had. I would make it a policy that everybody obtain uh, the training and bring in professionals to come in and teach uh, my staff about mental health awareness and also, you know, I, I worked under, um, at the Manhattan DA's office with Judge Dora Irizarry, the first Puerto Rican chief judge of the Eastern District of New York, actually the second circuit of the federal court and I remember her telling me, I worked at the Bronx DA's office and I couldn't take it anymore because I had to prosecute a case of a young five month old kid that was sexually abused. I couldn't take it. You think that the ADAs that come to deal with the investigators that see the crime and they hear these cases, that doesn't affect them? Let me tell you, it does affect them and they take it home. They need to receive mental health training, health and wellness training as well as being able to identify it. Now with the State Bar, the New York State Bar Association, which I am the vice chair of the trial lawyer section, we do a lot with mental health training, health Last and sentence. wellness classes, and alcoholism. That's very important, and the training will be provided. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Katz. My question is for Ms. Katz. Um, so when we talk about our criminal justice system uh, and decriminalizing poverty, getting to the root causes of crime, homelessness is, is a big one. Destabilization of people's lives is uh, the driver of not just low level and quality of life crimes, but violent crime as well. Um, we have all talked about how we're gonna target bad landlords, corporate bad actors, predatory lenders, um, employers. Uh, I have made the commitment not to accept any corporate dollars, any corporate PAC money so that I can remain completely accountable to my communities and no one else. You have not made that commitment. In fact, you have taken over co a quarter of a million dollars of real estate uh, and prison industrial complex money. How do you reconcile that with your Last platform? sentence. Thank you. I've raised money for many people all over the city of New York who know my 25 years of history in public service. And you want to talk about standing up? I stood up to developers when we did Astoria Cove. I voted against it because they weren't doing fair wages and they had unsafe work sites. I stood up just last month for Willits Point to make sure that we were using trades. And I have cost developers all across the city hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars by changing the culture in the New York City Council 20 years ago when we started doing public um, labor agreements with developers to make sure that they were using good labor in all of the projects they were doing. You want to know how I would stand up to them? Because I've already cost developers hundreds of millions of dollars. That is why I am the only candidate up here who has actually created a Bureau of Housing Fraud, which will work from day one in the Queen DA's office because right now when there's an accident on site on any labor site in the, in the borough of Queens and in the city of New York 
the Department of Buildings or the Department of Investigation will tell you when you need an assistant district attorney to be able to go to the work site. I have stood up against powerful interests my entire yeah. life. Thank you. And that won't change as the DA. Uh, so, the, so the next phase is we have questions um, from Twitter, online, and uh, you guys right in the audience. So I'm going to try to um, go through these questions as fast as possible. Each candidate has one minute to respond, um, and I'm going to try to be super strict so we can get as many questions as possible. Um, my apologies. I, ha I have to step out because the Queens County Bar is honoring my friend Ken Standard, first, second black president of the New York State Bar Association. So I apologize, but I have to leave. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's get right into these questions. Uh, candidates keep referring, um, referencing supervised release and other services in place of cash bail. What happens when someone doesn't meet the conditions? What will the candidates do uh, in those circumstances? Um, and the same question for diversion, and I'm gonna put another question with that. Um, another question to go along with that is, what steps do you plan to take to ensure we're not subjecting people to needless surveillance and incarceration? Um, I guess we'll start uh, with Ms. Mallet. We haven't started down there yet. So when, when people don't follow the, <coughs> the parameters of what they're supposed to be doing, I think it's incumbent upon the district attorney to also meet with the defense attorney and find out exactly why they haven't been meeting what they're supposed to be doing. And we need to be able to reevaluate that and make sure that there are steps in place so that they can be successful in terms of the conditions and the diversion programs that they're under. But it's incumbent upon the district attorney's office to have those open lines of communication with the defense and to figure out holistically how we can make it better and more successful for the person who's charged with a crime. We'll keep going now. Yep. Okay. So the first thing that I want to change as DA is I'm not going to require individuals to plead guilty to get the services they need. So I'm gonna divert the individual from the criminal justice system without having to plead guilty to a crime and then work with them, the program that they're in, and also their defense counsel to try to get them back on track. Because once you hit somebody with a criminal conviction, it's a permanent scar on their record and it's a permanent scar on their life. And they get you know, denied schooling and they get denied jobs, they get denied licenses. So you're not helping them by giving them a criminal conviction. What you're doing is you're exacerbating the issue. You're bringing them deeper into a hole. So you have to take that opportunity that you have to help them, to make sure that the program is working with them, to make sure that they have the support system they need. It might be another issue that's uh, you know preventing them to succeed in a program like poverty, like housing, like economic hardship. And if you don't address those other issues, what's going to happen is they're going to keep failing. And, and But you can't give up on them. Even when they give up on themselves, you can't give up on them. You have to work with the system to try to save every life because every life matters. And, and, and if you hit them with a conviction, you've, everyone's lost. Thank you. So the question is, what would you do if a person is not complying with the supervision that's been given, Cor right? Correct. Thank you. Um, so I, I think we have to look at, one, whether the person is substantially um, complying, because a lot of times there are, are technical rules that are violated that we really shouldn't be saying, well, this is now the reason that you detain somebody or incarcerate somebody for. I can't tell you how many times programs really uh, provide a level of over-supervision. Over you know, for example, I've had clients, um, a, a client who recently had gotten custody of his two children and his supervision conflicted with the child care. He wasn't reoffending or anything like that. He was substantially um, complying. We shouldn't be violating folks for that. We should be looking at their lives and saying, hey, the goal is just to keep people safe and keep people rooted in their communities. If they're not hurting others, if they're not reoffending, then we need to work with them to find ways to, to make sure that they're staying in their communities. I'm going to say the thing that maybe perhaps everybody up here might be uh, afraid to say is we will do everything we possibly can um, to keep people rooted in their communities with as little supervision as possible. Um, but at the end of the day, again, there is a balance, and if we get to a point where none of our, our services, nothing's really working, Last then we, ha we are in a position where maybe somebody needs to be removed from their community, but that we have to take care of the case as quickly as possible and resolve it as quickly as Thank possible you. through speedy trial and discovery reforms. So I think the first question we need to ask is why they're not complying. 
Yeah, I met with um, about 30 women the other day who are out of Rikers or on work uh, release down here. And on parole, for instance, I'll give you an example. A lot of the women were complaining, and they were right, that they're being set up for failure on parole. They have to go to their parole meetings. They're held by the parole uh, officer. They're missing work. They miss their meetings. They miss the programs that they agreed to be in. And there's no excuse for, meeting those, for not being in those programs and not making those meetings. And they end up being in violation. So I think you need to look at why people aren't uh, complying with what they're supposed to do. You can't set people up for failure. And so it's an individual basis to make sure that we are doing what is right for them, what they can comply with, and when they don't, find out the reason. But at the end of the day, if you're not complying, there has to be some ramifications of coming back into the system and trying to figure out how we can make it better. There's a reason that they were on diversion in the first place. Right, so we need to make sure that we comply with that. Thank you. So one of the problems with the Queens District Attorney's Office is that it has this carceral mentality. It has this punitive mentality. They really believe, in fact, the number two executive in the office who I debated on the issue of Rikers Island, I hope we get to talk about Rikers Island tonight, actually said in the course of that debate, I was for closing Rikers, he wasn't, every person on Rikers Island deserves to be there. There's this attitude that giving someone access to drug treatment, uh, mental health treatment, is, is a gift, is um, something that is a privilege. But in reality, we should be keeping folks who have mental illness, addiction, out of the criminal justice system in the first place. And those of us who have worked with um, uh, programs for people with mental illness, people with addiction issues, know it's very common for people to, quote unquote, flunk out of the program the first time, the second time, the third time. The fact that you're having a criminal conviction hanging over your head is not going to make you complete Last the drug sentence. treatment program or the mental uh, health treatment program. And so we need to not penalize people who work through programs if they fail the Thank first you. time or the second time. Uh, so just a quick follow up, um, yes or no, to uh, I'm, this is across the oh. board for everyone. Um, so if they don't meet the conditions, will you seek jail time? Yes or no? Uh, we can start right with you, Mr. Weinstein, since you finished up. Sure. At some point, yes. We'll, we'll go down the line to you, Ms. Mapp. Yes, at some point, absolutely. I don't believe so, no. I'm gonna agree with y'all. Uh, no, we will do everything we can and if there's nothing left that we can do, then yes. Same. There we go, nice and direct. Um, how, how will you ensure that your vision reaches down the line to all your ADAs in court? We'll uh, start with you, Mr. Nevis. The first thing you have to do to make sure that the vision um, reaches all the way down is to, is to be a leader. And that's what's important about this election, ladies and gentlemen. You have to pick the next leader of the district attorney's office, an agency that's over 600 people strong, and to have prosecutors been there for years. So what leader are you gonna pick? Are you gonna pick somebody who's been practicing a few years? Are you gonna pick somebody who's never done law enforcement in, in the past? Or are you gonna pick somebody who's been doing it and has been doing it progressively for over 18 years? That's what it, it's about, getting the leadership straight and getting the vision clear, and then replacing the leadership, the executives, and up to the bureau chiefs completely because we have to have different minded people in that office. We have to have individuals in that office that want to see justice done, that want to see people diverted from the criminal justice system, that want to see people's lives changes, and that want to change the metrics of, uh, of the office, not to charge and incarcerate, but to, to ask, how many kids do we divert from the criminal justice system? How many, men how many en mentally Ill, Ill individuals did we divert? That has to be the new vision of the office. So anytime that you're trying to implement culture change, it has to come from the top. And that's where the vision starts. And we, I did it in Brooklyn with Ken Thompson. I did it at the Civilian Complaint Review Board. I did it with Attorney General Carl Racine in, at the Attorney General's office in DC. And it has to start from the top of the leadership. The executive level has to be changed 
the senior staff level has to be changed and also on down the road to deputy chiefs, bureau chiefs as well as deputy chiefs. You have to implement justice reform and the new vision through your leadership. And then what you do is you get in fresh blood from the bottom up by hiring new people who have the same leadership and the same vision that you do in terms of criminal justice reform. And that's what I plan to do as district attorney. The leadership in the office has to change. It has to be reflective of this room. They have to have women at the top. They have to have people of color. Black and brown communities need to be represented at the top of the leadership change. LGBTQ communities, they all have to have a seat at the table where the important Last policy sentence. decisions are being made. Thank you. So the question basically is, how do you take these reform ideas and plans that you, you say that you have and make sure that they're actually happening at the ground level in the district attorney's office? Well, first of all, I know the Queens District Attorney's Office. I oversee the Queens District Attorney's Office. I oversee its operations. I oversee its budget. But my own leadership experience leading a council office that conducts oversight hearings, that conducts um, that uh, passes important legislation, that appropriates funding. That's leadership. The um, uh, experience that I had as a lawyer in private practice, for 15 years I represented people who were discriminated against or sexually harassed on the job or had their wages stolen. Like I know what it means to be in a courtroom and represent a client and hold wrongdoers accountable. And if you're a leader and someone who comes to the office with a strong vision, and a knowledge of the office, and the experience as a lawyer, and experience leading offices, making public policy, then you can know that the policies that Last you implement sentence. at the top are going to be implemented throughout the organization, and you're going to be able to make real reform happen. I'm a leader right now of an office that has a five and a half million dollar budget, a seventy million dollar a year capital budget and has over 65 employees that I lead right now. I don't work for someone who leads it. I actually do the leading right now. And so as the district attorney of the borough of Queens, I will set policy and programs inside my office. There will be plea bargains to the lowest level of time that anyone can have. There will be sentences that go on a low side of that. And anyone who deviates from the policy that I have developed as a leader, the way I have as the Queensboro President's Office, will have to somehow tell me that that has happened. And we will figure out the best way to make that happen. A memo every single time it goes with, uh, outside of the policy that I have created meetings on a monthly basis to make sure that we are all still on the same page. But the ADAs, once I create these policies, once I create the criminal justice reform culture that is going to happen in the DA's office, they should get in line, or I'm sure that there are other employers who would be happy to employ them. This is where my experience as a public defender matters. Um, you know, when you go into that office, one, you know that there's gonna be three types of folks. Ones who went in wanting to do the work, but the metrics of success didn't allow them to do that good work. Then there's gonna be folks that are resistant to change, but they're gonna come around. And then there's gonna be folks that aren't uh, with it for the accountability, the transparency, and they're gonna leave, right? But understanding and pinpointing where you need to make changes um, to, to have those policies have the intended impacts to set those cultures, I know that the trial bureau chiefs are a place to start because they implement policies and set culture for the 100 plus line ADAs that fall beneath them. When we talk about how are you going to make sure that your policies are being followed, you have to know how it works on the ground. Larry Krasner actually had trouble with this. It took him a few months to know that his line ADAs weren't doing what he said to do. What I would do, invite court watch into our courtrooms because it starts with our line ADAs, right? And so they are a great resource in saying, this is what your ADAs are doing on the ground and you're able to go in the second that something happens, nip it in the bud and say, this won't be tolerated rather than let it snowball out of control. Um, so that's practically speaking, how I would Last make sure sentence. my ADAs followed those uh, policies. Thank you. Appreciate all your answers uh, to each other's questions and then to the audience questions. Um, last, like we talked about in the beginning, we'll uh, get to the closing remarks um, where each of you will have uh, 60 seconds um, again for your closing remarks. And um, I think we started down here in alphabetical order for opening remarks. Um, so we'll start reverse to close. Yeah, yeah, we're 60 seconds, closing remarks. Okay. This election is about one question. 
who are you going to hire as the chief law enforcement officer of the county of Queens? That's what it's about. You're hiring somebody with your vote. And you're going to have to ask three questions. One, do they have the experience to do the job? Have they done the job before? Because when you hire somebody, that's the first thing you look at, right? Have they done the job before? Do they know what they're doing? The second thing is, can they lead? Have they led? See, you know I know how to do the job because I've been doing it for 18 years, and not at the Queens DA's office. I've been doing it at the Brooklyn DA's office, the New York State Attorney General's office, the U.S. Attorney General's office of the Northern District of New York, and the United States Army. I've been doing it in that, those, those arenas. I've seen what right looks like, and the fact of the matter is I've been leading for my entire career leading large agencies at the attorney general's office. That's how you know I'm going to lead on day one. That's why I'm not going to be looking to other people to advise me on how to do my job. Because you elected somebody to do the job, not to get other people to do the job. Thank you. I'll agree with Mr. Nieves. This is a very, very important race. There hasn't been a competitive race for Queens District Attorney since 1977, 42 years. And the good voters of Queens County need to ask that very important question. Who is qualified and who is experienced to do this very important job of the top law enforcement official in a county of 2.4 million people, the, the most diverse county in the country, if not the world? I have worked on both the defense and the prosecution side. I have worked alongside police officers. I have also held them accountable for their misconduct. I'm the only candidate in this race who has led a citywide agency with a $16.5 million budget and 200 employees, 110 employees as Deputy Attorney General, and 1,200 employees as Special Counsel with Brooklyn DA Ken Thompson. I'm the only candidate in this race who's look in, looked into the eyes of a woman who was raped, a child who was abused, a person who was wrongfully convicted, and the victim of police misconduct. And Queens deserves somebody who has experience and qualifications. So you've heard a lot of similar ideas and policies expressed tonight. And you have a choice to make. Which one person are you going to elect to be the district attorney? And I would submit to you that it's really a straightforward choice. You want to elect someone who's been doing exactly this work. Not the people who built the prosecutorial system that we're trying to tear down. Not people who've spent their life working on other issues as important as they may be. But for my time as a public official, we have attacked over policing and mass incarceration. We have attacked the criminalization of mental illness, addiction, and poverty. We have attacked the cash bail system. I've attacked police misconduct. I'm very proud to have the support of Gwen Carr, Eric Garner's mom, Valerie Bell, Sean Bell's mom, because they know that I'm going to hold police accountable because I've been doing it. And so this is a once in a generation opportunity to elect a district attorney. And if you really want to radically transform the criminal justice system in Queens Last sentence. and be certain that the person you elect is going to do it, elect the person who's been doing it. Thank you all very much. This is a race about trust. The district attorney for all the laws that are passed are gonna have a lot of discretion. And there is no doubt that you need to have faith in that person. And I agree with my colleagues, experience matters. Experience matters. But it also matters to get real criminal justice reform, to make sure that you get people to buy into that system here in Queens, where no one has bought into the system of criminal justice reform for over 30 years. I am not a career prosecutor. I am not part of the problem. Instead, I've spent my last six years and last 25 years standing up to powerful interest and winning every single step of the way at every single job I have had. You want judges to let people go without cash bail, even if they're not legally required to. You need someone they trust who is leading the team of district attorneys. You want someone to let people into the diversion programs to get drug rehab, to get mental health illness uh, services, to make sure that they get homeless services so they're not out on the street. You want a judge and a defense attorney and a prosecutor to all work Last together sentence. to make sure that happens. You need someone you can trust. Out of all the candidates that are sitting up here, I am the only one Thank that you. has a record in the entire borough of Queens and have answered to my constituents Sorry, every single day. Thank you.
you have heard a lot of similar sounding I ideas tonight, but the difference is in the details. And the fact is, is that I've learned as a public defender that in the law, even the smallest differences in candidate positions can have massive disparities in how they're implemented in court. Um, so, you know, we are in this position where you have to ask yourself, who do you trust? to do these things because I can't tell you how many times I've been in court when a new progressive policy comes down and my client who was the exception to the rule yesterday remains to the exception to the rule today and that can't happen. It has to stop, we deserve <coughs> better. So again, the most important question you can consider in ending mass incarceration, our broken system in Queens, is who do you trust to do these things? Because this is a once in a generation opportunity to transform our system and we can't afford to have career politicians that haven't been in criminal court or career prosecutors who have thrived in the very system they now say they seek to dismantle, exactly. right? What, so what I am asking you to do is vote in somebody who has always done this work. I'm asking you to vote in this Queens-born queer Last Latina sentence. public defender uh, to bring the change and justice that we deserve <coughs> here in Queens, because I promise to bring you all with me. Thank you. Thank you. So, so that will wrap it up. I, I appreciate everyone coming out. Um, obviously, really appreciate the candidates for coming today and uh, deciding to speak with us. Um, but more importantly, make sure you do go out there June 25th and vote. Um, that's when it really matters. Thank you.